Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today we are going to be comparing the Prune Barge to Battleship New Jersey. It is BB44 USS California. This video was requested by a viewer who donated in memory of his father who served on board California uh, from 1944 through the end of the war. California is the second and final Tennessee class battleship. They are part of the big five, the uh, five most powerful American battleships at the end of World War I uh, before the Washington Naval Treaty is signed. Uh, so the big five are the core of the American battle line all the way through uh, pretty much until the fast battleships start coming online when the United States enters World War II. Interestingly, because they are the most powerful and most modern American ships of the time, they receive far fewer upgrades than, say, battleships like Texas and Arizona uh, that, that receive fairly extensive modernizations during the interwar period. And uh, they were supposed to receive their major modifications in 1941, uh, but the condition of things around the world delayed that. And uh, when the attack on Pearl Harbor comes, they're still very close to their as-built uh, configurations. So, since California is damaged at Pearl Harbor, we'll talk about that more in the future, she receives a major, major upgrade uh, between 1942 and uh, 1944 and becomes one of the most modern battleships in the fleet. She, she leaves the yard almost as a brand new ship and serves throughout the end of the war. California was authorized in 1915, laid down in 1916. Normally it would take about four years to build a battleship because World War I era priorities, i.e. building destroyers uh, and transport vessels, took priority over battleships. California's construction is delayed. Uh, she's not launched until 1919, and then she's finally commissioned in 1921. These delays were pretty critical for Anglo-American relations at this time, because the Royal Navy obviously isn't commissioning too many capital ships during the war. Uh, they are right there on the front lines, and they didn't like that across the Atlantic, the United States uh, had 18 capital ships under construction, the two Tennessees, the four Colorados, uh, the six South Dakotas, and the six Lexingtons. The Tennessee class is right in the middle of the line of standard battleships. So she is a slight improvement over the preceding New Mexico class, and she is only slightly different from the Colorado class that comes after her. Uh, the major differences between California and the uh, preceding ships, actual operational experience of the standard type battleships showed that hull mounted casemate guns got very wet. Uh, so, on Tennessee and California, they were the first ones where they moved the five-inch anti-torpedo boat or secondary battery up into the lowest level of the superstructure, which is the O2 level on the ship. Uh, and that kept them dry and allowed them to be used in uh, more water. Texas is the closest you can come nowadays to seeing those hall-mounted casemates. Hers were moved up into the superstructure in the later 20s, Again, wartime experience demonstrating the need for this. And just like California, which gets this during construction, they have to reduce the number of barrels to fit them up there. Um, just like California, they're only O2 and O3 level. Um, so you can see this uh, evolution in action on Texas, which is um, really the, the closest thing left to Tennessee, even though that's Battleship 33 and we're talking about Battleship 44, so you've got nine ships in, in between. The Tennessees maintain the clipper bow that the New Mexicos introduce. They maintain the cage masts of the New Mexicos, but they add the new three-tiered fire control platform, which again is retrofitted onto Texas and other um, ships. And you see this on all of the Pearl Harbor battleships. Otherwise, armor, speed, and firepower remains the same as the preceding class. Again, during the interwar period, modifications are pretty light. She has her secondary battery modified from being primarily 5-inch 51 caliber guns with a couple of 3-inch 50s as anti-aircraft guns 
to including uh, five inch 25s, replacing the three inch and some of the five inch 51s. Um, she then gets some 50 caliber machine guns added, eventually some 1.1 inch Chicago pianos as her mid-range anti-aircraft defense. Uh, most importantly, she is the first battleship ever equipped with radar in the American Navy. She gets one of the first five CXAM sets that the Navy installs. The other units are installed on scouting forces like the aircraft carrier Yorktown and some of the heavy cruisers, but California, being Admiral Pai's flagship of the battle line, gets a uh, CXAM radar so that he gets a better picture of the battlefield. That's why we are filming this video in Battleship New Jersey's CIC. This is where our World War II era radar operations uh, were taking place. Now, initially, California didn't have a CIC. She doesn't get one until her reconstruction in 42 to 44. Uh, and as it turns out, her radar was not on during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, so, it did not do any good at that time, and, and then she wasn't in service in that configuration during the war. This wasn't any fault of the crew. It is very uncommon to have things like radar on when you're in port. Uh, for one thing, it can mess with all of the civilian electronics around you. During the interwar years, she serves with the battle force, uh, the other battleships in the fleet, doing the fleet problems, other things like that. Uh, she is at the attack on Pearl Harbor. The ship is opened up for an admiral's inspection, so watertight boundaries are not being observed. And um, critically, she had a couple of five inch and a couple of 50 caliber guns manned as ready mounts with ammunition already broken out for them. Uh, we always talk about how the fleet is caught unprepared at Pearl Harbor. California at least had part of her battery manned and ready when the attack began. And where other ships could not return fire for a while, California had ready service ammunition broken out, was able to fire. Um, it was the first lieutenant, the guy in charge of the deck division, who was the senior officer on board. When he realizes what's going on around eight o'clock in the morning, he uh, gives permission to open fire. So uh, California is one of the first ships to uh, be able to return fire and critically is able to put uh, fire on the Japanese aircraft while the magazines are being unlocked and, and the crew is going to general quarters. She takes at least one bomb and two torpedoes, uh, which causes her to start to roll over. Uh, counter flooding manages to save the ship. Her crew, uh, two torpedoes is well within the capability of the ship, fully manned and watertight. However, she does not have a full crew on board and she is not uh, watertight. So um, the fire from the bombs manages to um, put smoke in the boiler compartments, which impacts the ship's electrical abilities, which impacts the ship's ability to pump water off. Likewise, uh, water coming into the fuel tanks from where the torpedoes hit, get into the boilers along with the uh, contaminated oil which shuts them down, which prevents the electric pumps from running as well. Uh, so the ship settles into the mud, is not able to remain buoyant. As one of the more modern vessels and uh, suffering from heavy to moderate damage, not quite as bad as some of the other vessels, she is one of the priorities to be refit uh, after the attack. The least damaged battleships like Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee are returned to the fleet first. And then the attention turns to the modern ships like California and West Virginia. Uh, it takes two years to get California refloated back to the continental US and to get a major upgrade. During this time, she receives a superstructure that looks very similar to the South Dakota class battleships uh, and a fully modern electronic suite to go with it. Plus her anti-aircraft battery is heavily updated and Interestingly, the ship is widened significantly so that she can no longer fit through the Panama Canal, but to add extra torpedo defense. She uh, returns to the fleet in early 1944 and uh, fights through actions at Saipan and Tinian. Uh, Tennessee suffers a steering casualty while the two ships are operating together. 
and rams California, and so the two ships are taken out of action for a little bit of time while they are repaired. Uh, but both ships are back in action by the Battle of Leyte Gulf, where they form part of Admiral Oldendorf's uh, shore bombardment forces, which are sent to block southern force passing through Suragawa Strait. California is able to pick up the Japanese at a range of 21 miles, over 42,000 yards, on her surface search uh, Sugar George radar set. And uh, she, due to a limited number of armor-piercing shells, since these are the shore bombardment ships, holds fire until the Japanese ships get closer. California is the first American battleship to open fire. She will expend 63 rounds of 14-inch ammunition during the battle. Uh, and a miscommunication on maneuvering will have her uh, veer out of the line of battle and mask Tennessee's guns for a period of time, but California is able to uh, maintain uh, relatively consistent fire until the two Japanese battleships are sunk and the Japanese fleet has turned around and retreated. Shortly after the war, with the battleships uh, now considered obsolete and with much more modern battleships in the fleet, California is decommissioned by uh, 1947, uh, and she will be scrapped in 1959 without ever being used again. Interestingly, one of the cage masts removed from California sits on Ford Island for a period of time um, as a stood up tower and, and was possibly the last uh, battleship cage mast in existence. Um, I'm not sure what happened to it or when it was actually removed. Some more California fun facts. I believe California had more Medal of Honor recipients than any other battleship. Uh, for the attack on Pearl Harbor, four of her crew members are awarded the Medal of Honor. But her most famous crew member is not a Medal of Honor recipient. Her most famous crew member is, uh, without a doubt, Yosemite Prunes, a bear that was given to the ship's crew as a mascot during the interwar period. Uh, many stories are told about prunes, such as her loving to uh, climb up the battleship's cage masts. Uh, but eventually, poor Yosemite prunes uh, had to be dishonorably discharged. One too many times, the captain returned to his in-port cabin to find prunes asleep on his couch, and so she was interred at the San Diego Zoo for the rest of her life. So. How does California stack up to a much more modern Iowa-class battleship? As built, she displaces around 33,000 tons. Uh, as reconstructed by 44, she's uh, around 40,000 tons, which is part of why the torpedo protection and the width of the ship was expanded to allow for um, all this extra weight to be added without submerging her armored belt completely below water and removing the ship's reserve of buoyancy. She was 624 feet long, designed to be 97 feet wide, uh, and drew about 30 feet of water. She could make 21 knots and sail 8,000 nautical miles at a speed of 10 knots. She had eight boilers like an Iowa-class battleship, but only two uh, electric generators. She had turboelectric drive and then four electric motors. As built, she could carry 1,100 men, uh, but as operated during World War II, she carried twice that number, 2,200 men on board. She had 12 14-inch 50 caliber guns in four triple turrets. Um, actually, these were three-gun turrets. The 14-inch 50 uh, was the first three-gun turret the U.S. Navy made, which meant that the barrels were all in individual sleeves and had their own elevating mechanism so they could elevate and fire independently. She was uh, designed to carry 14 5-inch 51s, four 3-inch guns, and two 21-inch torpedo tubes, one on each broadside. As rebuilt, she had a maximum of 16 5-inch 38 guns, 52 40 millimeter guns, and 43 20 millimeter guns. So for firepower, she rates just a little bit below an Iowa-class battleship. She has more barrels, but they're a slightly smaller caliber. Um, for five-inch guns, 
She's a significantly smaller ship. She, she's one third smaller than an Iowa uh, in both weight and length, but uh, she has just four fewer five inch anti-aircraft guns. Uh, and not many fewer 20 millimeter guns, uh, only about 60% as many 40 millimeter guns. There just wasn't enough room on deck for more uh, anti-aircraft guns on, on these smaller ships. Uh, so in terms of firepower and anti-aircraft firepower, she has a similar electronic suite at the end of her career to a modern US fast battleship, but she's still a little bit uh, underpowered just because of her size. In terms of speed, obviously 21 knots, she's a little slower um, than even the 27 knot fast battleships, much less the 33 knot Iowas. Uh, where she really stands out is her armor plate. Her belt is 13 and a half inches. Her deck was originally three and a half inches and an extra two to three inches was added during her reconstruction, uh, which brings the total thickness up to uh, more than an Iowa class battleship. However, three inches plus three and a half inches is not more effective than six inches of solid armor. Uh, so not quite as effective at a long range protection, but more protected against short range shell fire. Uh, and with her torpedo defense being deeper than an Iowa class battleships, she had a better torpedo defense. Her barbettes were 13 inches, so a couple inches thinner than on an Iowa. Her faceplate was 18 inches, so pretty similar protection there. Uh, and her conning tower was 16 inches, although by the, uh, during her reconstruction, this is removed and uh, replaced with a control position that basically just had splinter protection, which other navies around the world were doing at that time. And, and quite honestly, I've said this before, I'm surprised that the Iowa-class battleships were actually built with armored conning towers. So, uh, how does this ship compare to an Iowa? Uh, obviously significantly smaller and cheaper. I am amazed with ships like this that were used and optimized for shore uh, bombardment that it was the Iowa class battleships that were reactivated in Korea and Vietnam. You don't need the 33 knot speed of an Iowa uh, and nobody else was operating comparable battleships uh, that we were going to war with, so you didn't need the Iowa class. Reactivating ships like California after the war would have been significantly cheaper. Remember, she's basically brand new after rebuilt, and you've got all the other standard battleships in reserve to draw parts from, as opposed to the Iowas are really just pulling parts from each other. When New Jersey's reactivated, they have to take a lot of stuff from uh, Iowa and Wisconsin, which means when those ships are reactivated, they've got to go and uh, track down parts elsewhere. But for shore bombardment, a ship like this with really heavy protection, a shallower draft, and every bit is modern, but just slower, she can just cruise up the coast of Korea or Vietnam and lob shells at the enemy all day. She carries more shells than in Iowa because she's got more turrets. Uh, so. I've always thought it was weird that these ships were not uh, maintained in the reserve fleet as long. Like, all right, Colorado, Maryland, they're, they're never modernized to the same degree. New Mexico, um, they're, um, New Mexico, Idaho, they're not modernized to the same degree. Get rid of them in the late 40s, early 50s. But in a lot of ways, it makes more sense to keep these ships around than any of the fast battleships. What do you think about that? Let us know in the comment section down below. Which battleships would you have retained after World War II? Which ones would you have been brought back for Korea and Vietnam? Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. Remember, today's video was funded by a donor who was interested in hearing about this specific information. There's a link in the description below if you would like to donate to support the museum. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us and our channel. Thanks for watching.